Welcome everyone to the Security Weekly Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. I am Paul Asadorian, and according to our guest on this segment, a decade after Stuxnet, Stuxnet's printer vulnerability, printing still the stairway to heaven. Uh, Peleg Hadar is a senior security researcher with Safe Breach Labs. Welcome, Peleg. Hi. Great to be here. And uh, Tomer Barr is the Safe Breach Labs lead. He's here with us as well. Welcome. Hi. Um, so I, I am fascinated with Stuxnet uh, and and vulnerabilities. So I'm excited for this. Uh, what made you guys look look into this particular vulnerability and its relationship to Stuxnet? So a uh, decade after Stuxnet, we started to think uh, it was a very major events in the cybersecurity world, and we started to think would it be a Stuxnet 2.0? Allegedly, of course. So we started to dig in into Stuxnet and divided it into three major parts. The first part is the, the propagation capabilities. Uh, the second part is the evasion techniques. And the third part is the specific Siemens PLC's vulnerabilities and activity. So uh, after thinking about it, we decided that uh, a decade after Stuxnet, the most interesting part is the first part, the propagation capabilities, mm. because it's relevant to, it may be relevant to other targets as well, because those capabilities are, uh, if someone will uh, build the, uh, uh, a replacement for each one of them, it will become a very powerful uh, tool. So we started digging into the specific uh, uh, capabilities. There were actually five major capabilities. Uh, three of them were... Uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities and exploits, and two are uh, local privilege escalation mm -hmm. vulnerabilities. And we, go the, we, we started one by one, and we found out that the, there was a replacement, the other newer vulnerability during the last decade that uh, for our luck, it was reported uh, in a safely manner to Microsoft and they fixed it. Uh, but uh, for the LMK and for the RPC vulnerability and, and for the Win32, UK and the task scheduler, all of them had a replacement. The only missing part for the puzzle to build the allegedly build the Stuxnet 2.0 was the printer spooler vulnerability, which we haven't found any other replacement for it in the last decade. Uh, and it was a very uh, good challenge to, to try to find uh, the last missing part uh, to allegedly build Stuxnet 2.0. So this was uh, originally the first motivation of the research. So was there uh, the original Stuxnet versions, they did use a printer spooler vulnerability, an older one? Is that that's correct? Yeah. And did you guys find a newer one since that yeah. one has been patched? Is that the, the kind of the narrative, right? Yeah, so actually we yes. found three vulnerabilities, but I'll let Peleg uh, mm. take it forward. Yeah, so actually, as you mentioned, uh, we did find another one another printer spooler vulnerability, uh, which uh, was pretty similar to, to the root cause of the, the first one, except that the fact that the first one was actually remote code execution and we focused on uh, local private escalation. Mm -hmm. So we started to, to dive into the print spooler and when we started looking at it, we actually found a vulnerability, which is a denial of service one, uh, which allows an unprivileged user actually to, to crash the print spooler service and just plug any printing operation in the whole computer. So it was interesting and we were intrigued by it. So we, we started to, to dive in deeper. And then uh, we just found another one, which is uh, elevation of privilege, which allows an unprivileged user to use the principle or mechanism to actually gain uh, system privileges, which is uh, more powerful than administrator. And we reported it to Microsoft on January and they fixed it on May. And, and uh, we have uh, more surprises, but we can't say it before uh, the presentation, so stay tuned. Right. Well, I, I will, you'll have to attend the talk uh, to get more. I, is it your experience uh, doing security research that oftentimes when there is a vulnerability and associated exploits with a particular service that further investigation reveals more vulnerabilities? I think uh, it's not always true, but I think that once uh, there are several vulnerabilities in a specific domain, a lot of other researchers uh, diving into this specific domain. I know that 
uh, MSRC told us that once we we, uh, we reported on the printer vulnerability and it was patched, uh, another uh, uh, researchers just started to look on it and uh, found more issues of it. So mm. I don't think that. Uh, you can say that uh, it's only because there are other vulnerabilities as well. It's just because a lot of people just taking a look of it and finding more issues. Are there elements of the print spooling service that make it particularly vulnerable? I don't uh, think so. Uh, yes, Tor, go ahead. I don't think it's make it specifically vulnerable uh, in comparison to other mechanism, but the printer spooler is a very... Uh, it's a old code. It, it started back yeah. into the 90s, and it uh, had few modifications over the years, but not major ones. So usually, uh, uh, older codes uh, may or you know, might be vulnerable uh, to uh, to more uh, vulnerabilities. But uh, in this case, I think that uh, we haven't found any other vulnerabilities in the last. Uh, 20 years. So in, in this case, it's not the case. Right. Uh, but it, it, it's uh, fascinating to see uh, your uh, exploit works on Windows 2000 until uh, the latest Windows 10. So, uh, And so that's the local privilege escalation vulnerability uh, you guys found, right? Actually, this is the denial of service vulnerability. Yep. Uh, the local privilege escalation vulnerability was tested uh, against uh, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 10. Mm -hmm. where we haven't tested it against uh, Windows 2000. The original uh, remote code execution vulnerability that was in the uh, print spooler, um, what, what was its relation to Stuxnet? Do you, can you guys, uh, like where on the timeline was it? Because I don't remember. So I don't know uh, to say ex exactly when it was on the timeline, but I do know that uh, Stuxnet was using it in order to propagate between uh, computers and mm -hmm. to to execute code on other computers, and uh, it was one of the propagation uh, uh, vulnerabilities it used. And actually, what's interesting is that uh, the root cause of uh, the vulnerability uh, is very similar to the one that we found. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we will uh, dive in exactly to the technical details during our uh, during sure. our talk, but I think it's very similar and uh, interesting. I've always wondered and speculated, and I don't, you know, you guys don't have to have a definitive answer, but I think it's fun to speculate um, where that exploit came from, like where some of the exploits came from uh, in Stuxnet, right? Did it come from one of our nation states? Did, did someone buy it somewhere? Um, it, it, can you just speculate, like, where some of these exploits might come from? How easy or difficult is it? Uh, to develop that exploit and keep it a secret for as long as they did? I think that uh, it is uh, speculative and we don't like to, to get into uh, you know speculations. But uh, I know that uh, a decade ago, it was much easier to, to develop a, an mm. exploit uh, than today because obviously Microsoft doing a tremendous job by adding more and more mitigations. Uh, so it was probably easier to, to develop one in order to execute code uh, and also the issue was uh, 10 years ago and, and also the one that we found was a logic vulnerability which is much more easier to exploit mm -hmm. than a memory corruption one so uh, i think it was uh, easy to exploit and regarding where does it come from i don't know <laughs> uh, but uh, it sounds interesting yeah well i you know i think that uh, you know, your analysis that it's not like the hardest vulnerability to exploit means it could have come from a lot of other sources, right? Not necessarily like that kind of opens up the scope as to where uh, it could come from. So I, I do agree that Windows uh, and Microsoft has done a great job uh, of making it, you know, basically our job's harder, right? Finding vulnerabilities and uh, and running exploits. Yeah, yeah definitely. You can see at the, the exploit kit industry, if you can call it industry. Mm. Uh, so there used to be a lot of exploit kits uh, services uh, out there, and now there are not so many because it's it's very hard to to get to go from uh, vulnerability into a working exploit against the latest Windows 10 or Windows Server versions. So yeah, that's a proof that it's harder. Right, and uh, mitigation for these vulnerabilities that we're talking about. I mean, it's really just uh, apply the patch, right? Are there other recommendations uh, that you folks have? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, we will present and we will re release 
uh, tomorrow uh, after our presentation uh, our uh, GitHub repository. So please come and check it. Mm. And we will uh, demo how uh, we took a different approach than patching. So of course, we, each vulnerability that we found, we uh, reported it to Microsoft. And we also recommend everybody to be keep your uh, uh, environments and operating system up to date. But it's, we think it's not enough. Uh, and we started to think about, not just about this specific vulnerability, uh, but to look at the entire uh, arbitrary right uh, arbitrary uh, right bug loss. So we uh, uh, release a POC that uh, it should be uh, treated as a POC. It's not a production ready mm. uh, code, mm -hmm. but uh, it's. Uh, I think it. I think it. Uh, it will find you find it uh, very interesting in Microsoft and also other vendors because it doesn't look at specific uh, vulnerability. You just look at the root cause of the entire bug class, mm -hmm. and uh, we understood that. Uh, a limited user, the most limited user, really doesn't have to have direct right access to the, the folders under System32 that are used for vulnerability uh, for, for for many vulnerabilities during the, the last recent years. So uh, our driver took a different approach, a more wider approach. So uh, some of these exploits do require uh, right access to the file system and specifically the System32 folder, and by removing that it basically wipe, wipes out that bug class as much as possible. Always exceptions, right? But Yes. Yeah. So uh, in, a, in a brief, uh, many vulnerabilities uh, within the, this bug class, which called arbitrary file write, which uh, eventually provides a local privilege escalation, mm. uh, it just uh, requires a user to write to, uh, uh, to a path, which eventually will uh, the, the service which is elevated will perform an elevated operation on this file. And we found that uh, in our vulnerability and in other vulnerabilities as well, uh, the user has some kind of uh, right permission to a uh, folder in system 32. And we found that uh, we are uh, we were able to mitigate it. And we, we will uh, demonstrate it during our talk. That's awesome. And when is your talk? So our talk is, uh, I think, 11 a.m., yeah. right? Yeah. 11, 11 a.m. tomorrow. 11 a.m. tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, fantastic. Uh, I look forward to your talk. Hopefully, uh, I can attend virtually, and I encourage our audience, uh, if you are registered for Black Hat, to attend the talk a decade after the Stuxnet printer vulnerability printing. Still the stairway to heaven. Uh, Peleg and Tomer, thank you so much for appearing on Security Weekly. Thank, thank you very much. much. Pleasure. Stay tuned. More interviews coming up next.